Well, good evening once again. Good to see y'all again this week. Looking forward to our time in the scriptures tonight. Exodus chapter 3 in God's word tonight, please. Exodus chapter number 3. We've entered the Exodus stage of God's program with Israel at this point. And been there for a couple of weeks now. We've made the, the transition and started getting into some of these opening chapters on last time. And I've uh, been looking at uh, some things that are uh, spoken about uh, here in early Exodus and the timing of the events as Israel has come into Egypt and uh, God preparing to deliver his people there. And of course, we have been introduced to Moses after uh, seeing the persecution and the affliction upon uh, Israel there in Egypt intensified. We're introduced to Moses, the deliverer. And uh, given some details uh, surrounding his birth and uh, his raising in the house of Pharaoh's daughter and also the uh, events there where he slew the Egyptian and had to, to flee and uh, dwelt in the land of Midian for 40 years there and then ended up last time uh, right about the, 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 the point at that 400 year mark according to the prophecy of Genesis 15 where the Lord appears to Moses in the burning bush. And the bush is on fire, but the Bible says it was not consumed. Mm -hmm. And as Moses turns aside to see that sight, the Lord begins to speak to him. And uh, he has a message for Moses. And we talked about some things in connection with that. And we actually saw there in that burning bush in Mount Horeb, which is uh, Sinai, of course, uh, that the Lord declares to Moses the issue of his name. And we talked about the name Jehovah. And how it was expressed to Moses here in uh, Exodus chapter 3. And the Lord revealed that in a twofold way. And of course, I've uh, called you here to Exodus 3. I want to show you those verses again and uh, just point out a few other things about uh, his name here and some things that are said with that. And then uh, continue on with uh, some information that's in the next couple of chapters here. Uh, but looking at the issue of the name, if you cast your eyes down to verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3, the Word of God says, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now, the expression there, you can see, I am that I am, all caps in our Bible there, as well as the, the secondary abbreviated expression, I am, that is his name, Jehovah. Uh, we'll see the, the word Jehovah, actually, as we progress on here in Exodus, uh, but uh, it's conveying the, uh, the idea, uh, a couple of ideas. He actually gives it in the two-fold uh, two way here in expressing it. And uh, the, the doctrinal significance that he's wanted to convey to Moses at this particular time. And, uh, of course, we've got the I am that I am. That's the full expression. Uh, we talked about how that that's communicating the issue of his timelessness. And, uh, of course, that's a big deal in view of the, the timing that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And that prophecy that was made to the fathers and uh, the events of Moses' life. But I am that I am. Communicating his timelessness, his eternal nature. And resident in that, therefore, the immutability of the nature of what he says. Uh, what he says, because he is, I am that I am, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, what he says can be fully relied upon. You don't have to worry about it mutating or tendency to think that it does, because it oftentimes does with us, uh, but the Lord's not like that. He's declaring that to Moses with the name I am that I am. It's the immutability of his counsel. Yes, and then he also gives Moses that abbreviated form there, and he says, you tell him that I am hath sent me unto you. I am. And my understanding of that is that he's not just reiterating the same thing, but he's actually he's communicating something additional to that. Hmm. And uh, the I am concept is uh, communicating uh, his unlimited capacity. Not only is he timeless or a God of unlimited time, an eternal God, but he's also a God of unlimited capacity uh, that uh, is uh, in possession of all the power to do everything that he needs to do in order to bring his purposes to pass. Whatever he needs to be to see that thing through, he says, I am that. And so he communicates that to us in that, that secondary expression there. When you look at that, that second expression especially, it's I am it almost seems like an incomplete expression, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 
seems like it, you know he doesn't finish the thought, and that's on purpose, you know. But it seems like it's an incomplete expression. Uh, I am blank, as it were. Right? There's a subject, there's a verb, but there's no predicate. You know, he says, "I am, I am what?" Okay, that's a natural question, and uh, of course, he he does that on purpose. Then the reason behind that is because that blank, that uh, it's not there in the text, of course, but you understand the sense that I'm conveying with that. The blank is something that's going to have to be filled in for the nation of Israel in order to educate them in everything that they're going to need this God to do for them to bring His purpose with them to pass. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an education. In this name, he's leaving it incomplete purposefully. Uh, he's he's wanting to educate Israel, and we'll actually see that start taking place of the next few chapters, where he's going to begin educating Israel in the fact of of their need for him. Hmm. They're going to need him as Jehovah to do a number of different things for them in order to bring his purpose with them out here in this kingdom in the land to pass. Hmm. They're not going to be able to produce that in and of themselves. They're going to need him to produce that. Amen. And uh, when he says, I am, you go tell him, I am hath sent me unto you. He leaves it blank because there's an education in the doctrinal significance of the name Jehovah that they're going to receive. And you're going to see that. Israel's going to be educated in their need. You, you've heard the expression, seen it in the Bible, their need to call upon the name of the Lord. Yeah. All right. They're going to have to call upon the name of Jehovah uh, to enact all that that name means on their behalf to, to bring his purpose with them to pass. They're going to have to be educated and taught that, and God means to do that and to show them his unlimited capacity to uh, to be everything that he needs them to be. Okay, And so we see that in the expression. Now, we actually did a, a subject study on this last year, if you remember, the name of the Lord. Yes. Yes. His name is Jehovah, we called that series. Right. It's about 11 hours where we looked at this, this matter in detail, and of course we still got that available. It's on the, the Facebook page, and I've got the audios on uh, my personal website if you're interested in uh, some of these matters, looking at those things more deeply. We talked about the Jehovah compound names and actually saw how that uh, through God's history, he fills in the blank for Israel. Uh, seven different uh, Jehovah compound names. And there, there's more than that in the scripture, but seven matters in particular uh, they get connected with uh, the feast days that get instituted with the law later on and a whole lot of significance to the Jehovah compound names and that I am expression. And uh, we've got those studies available and I just remind you of that now as we're looking at it in this series. We're not going to go into the same level of depth. Obviously, we did that last year, but we've got those on recording if you're interested in, in studying out uh, some of those things uh, more closely. Amen. I will mention, though, that one of the things that we highlighted in that series that Consistently, what we see with the name Jehovah as it's taught to Israel from this point forward is that there's there's really two primary issues connected with, with that name that is consistently linked up when you see it referenced throughout the scriptures. Uh, I am that I am is that name that's connected with his truth. And I am is the name that is consistently connected with his grace. And when you talk about Various passages of scripture that deal with the name of the Lord, the Psalms especially, will talk a lot about the name of the Lord and what that means on Israel's behalf. You consistently see the issues of truth and grace, or grace and truth, connected with the issue of Jehovah's name. And there's there's a, a host of scriptures that you can go to to substantiate that particular point, and we're not going to do that right now, but it is significant, I think, and it all ties back and really has its uh, its, its roots right here in these verses in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, in the two ways that God expresses his name to Moses in the burning bush. It's his truth and his grace. And we'll see that more as we, as we go ahead. Now, I read verses 13 and 14 to you. Let's read on now in Exodus 3 and look at something else here that the Lord says about this name in connection with what Moses is to go back and tell the children of Israel there in Egypt. Uh, Exodus 3, 15, And God said, Moreover, unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, or the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. He's further explaining to Moses some things about the name here. He, he intends for... Moses to go back to Egypt and he wants them, uh, wants Moses to declare this issue of his name to them. 
You can see in instruction like that, the beginning of an understanding that part of Moses' commission is actually going to be to school Israel in what the name Jehovah is all about. Uh, to begin to giving them a doctrinal education of what's resident in that name. And it really is that. It's not just a, a, a proper name to, that God wants to be called by, but there's a lot of doctrine that's meant to be communicated in that name and the significance of it. And so there's really going to have to be an education that takes place on the, the part of Israel as it relates to this name. And you notice at the end of the verse there, in verse 15, that God says that this is my name forever. Right? Jehovah, what he's just been talking about in the previous verses. This name, Jehovah, is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. So obviously the name has some design behind it. God wants Israel specifically to know him by this name. And they're going to know me this way forever. Okay. If they're going to know this name forever, then that obviously it would communicate to me that there's going to be this name's going to be inextricably tied to all that he's going to be doing for Israel to bring his purpose with them to pass. Mm -hmm. Right? He's going to operate by that name. This is how they're going to know him. This is how they're going to understand him, and 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 this is what they're going to need to be looking at. He says not only that, he says that this is my memorial. Unto all generations. So there's a, a memorial concept that God wants tied to that name. It's kind of reasonable, I would think, maybe you agree with me, that this name is going to be significant and significantly tied to everything that God's wanting Israel to know about his plan and purpose with them from this point forward. Right? If he's going to have them memorialize it and he wants them to have it in, in remembrance forever throughout their generations... It's going to be a significant issue, a big, big issue that is going to be really starting here and just growing from this point forward. He wants them to know that name and the significance of it. Now, this concept of a memorial, right? God intends for the name Jehovah to be memorialized throughout Israel's generations. Memorial. You think about that term. A memorial is something that's established for a purpose of reminding people of some purpose, person, or event that has happened at a point in time. Person or event that's happened at a point in time. A memorial, obviously, in the root of the expression itself, it's something that's supposed to impact the memory. Right? Serve as that reminder. Bring something back to your memory so that when you're, when you're observing that memorial, it, it causes certain thoughts to recur in your mind. Right? It brings you back to a place where you think on something again. Okay? And it can keep something right there in front of your face, as it were, so that it doesn't easily slip away. It's meant to, to impact the memory and the mind and to have minds, uh, have thoughts recur in the mind. And also it's, a, it's an opportunity and even a prompting to teach the successive generations about the significance of whatever it is that's being memorialized. Right? It's an opportunity to remember and it prompts an opportunity to teach. Because as time goes on and the generation progresses, they're going to have children that are coming up. And as that memorial issue dawns upon the mind again and they're confronted with it again and have to think upon it again, obviously what they're going to be doing and should be doing with that is using that as an opportunity to teach their children some things about it. Okay? And in this particular case, the issue of the name of the Lord, the name Jehovah, he says that's to be a memorial unto you and to all your generations. There's going to be a, a teaching opportunity in connection with what God wants Israel to be doing with this name. Okay, A successive generational education that's going on. And that's, that's really what a, a memorial's purpose is and the, the function that it serves. So again, I would emphasize in connection with that point that if God intends for it to be memorialized throughout Israel's generations, then that obviously means that there's going to be significance there's going to be some understanding and there's to be some doctrinal comprehension on the part of the Israelites from henceforth as to what all that means. We can call that an education in the name Jehovah and what God's communicating to Israel at this time through Moses and the name that he's revealed. Now, we're going to see the significance of both expressions of the name here being taught to Israel. God is actually going to begin teaching it to Israel really from this point forward. You could say it starts about chapter 6 once you get through some of these other initial details. But really, from this point forward, and the things that God's going to be doing in Egypt, while Israel is still captives under the thumb of the Egyptians, and even beyond that, once they cross over the Red Sea, get out there in the wilderness, 
God is going to be educating his nation in the reality of what the name means and their own spiritual condition and the need that they have for all that that name means. Uh, we'll see that from this point to about uh, chapter 14 or so, you're going to have a particular emphasis where he's educating them in the I am that I am concept while they're in Egypt. Once they get out into the wilderness, he's going to start teaching them some things about the I am expression. That'll lead up through about chapter 18. And so he's really going to school his nation in both aspects of what the name means so that when they come to Sinai, after they've exited Egypt in chapter 19, they understand some things about what his Jehovah name is all about, and he's going to present them with the option, of course, to continue to be dealt with that way by his name or by another standard. Okay, And so we'll talk about those things as we get along, but I think it's important to see the lead up that God's going to be schooling them in this issue of his name Jehovah all the way up until that time, mm -hmm. really starting from this point forward. And uh, I wanted to, to show you that, and uh, we're not going to look at everything that's going to be seen here, but in connection with that, that idea that God is going to begin teaching them and also his purpose throughout their generation to have it as a memorial, we can skip through some of these chapters and see how that God brings up that concept several times with them uh, before they get to chapter 19. So let's, let's do that really quickly, if we can. If we'll skip over to chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12. And I'll begin reading here in verse 11. This is uh, the night that uh, before they're going to actually exit Egypt after the other plagues have, have uh, taken place. And we'll look at some things about the plagues. But uh, in the narrative here, it's the night before they go out and the Lord has given them instructions concerning the Passover and how they're to eat the Passover. And that's what he's talking about here. If we pick up in verse 11, chapter 12, it says, And thus shall ye eat it, right, the Passover lamb, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, let me point out here that you see the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Right? In the King James Bible, that's the way the translators express the name Jehovah. Okay, So when you see all caps, you're talking about Jehovah. You're talking about I am. Okay, So in connection with the Passover and what he's having them do with the slaying of the lamb, applying the blood to the doorposts and uh, so forth to be saved from the, the death angel that's passing over the land of Egypt there. He says that they're to eat this lamb and he says specifically there that it's the Lord's Passover. Yeah. Not just the Passover, mm -hmm. but this is Jehovah's Passover. Right. Okay, there, There's some things that you should be connecting here about the slaying of the lamb and the blood with the name Jehovah mm -hmm. and what it does for you and how it's your safety and how it protects you uh, from the, the death of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. All right. I am Jehovah. He says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Okay? Verse 14. He says, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Mm -hmm. So there's the concept again. This day is to be unto you a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, and ye shall keep it a feast by ordinance forever. You notice verse 14, you've got the word memorial, you've got the word generations, you've got the words forever. Same words that he was talking about back in chapter number 3. In connection with the Passover, this is going to be a memorial to them. And you'll see that this, this Passover... Uh, ordinance, this feast, as it's called, gets codified in the law later on. God actually commands them that every year, this is one of the, the seven feasts on their calendar that they are required to keep. He calls it the Lord's Passover. He calls it the Feast of the Lord. This is to be a memorial unto your generations. This is a time in Israel that I'm designating that you're going to observe unto the Lord. And during that time, there's supposed to be a reminder and an impact upon their memory about what the Lord did back here in Egypt with the Passover lamb. I want that are memorialized. I want you constantly remembering that year by year by year. We see that, uh, as I said, there's, there's actually seven feasts that end up getting put upon Israel's yearly calendar that the law required, uh, referred to collectively as the feasts of the Lord or the feasts of Jehovah. And uh, they're, they're meant to, to impact Israel's memory. And we see the Jehovah compound names actually connected with each one of the feasts 
as well. But that's that's most concerning. The firstborn being set apart to the Lord. And uh, look at uh, verse, pick it up in verse 3 here. It says, And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Right? There's something they're supposed to remember. Keep in memory. Why? He said, For by strength of hand, the Lord, or Jehovah, brought you out from this place. There shall no living bread be. This day came ye out in the month of Eve, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall ye eat seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, so here, they're holding this feast, and God's wanting to show their sons something. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord, Jehovah, did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. Here he's talking about the feast of unleavened bread that followed the Passover. Another feast of the Lord and an opportunity therefore for Israel to edu uh, educate the successive generations in what the Lord had done for them. The strength of hand that the Lord had shown on their behalf, educating them in his name. Mm -hmm. Chapter 17. Exodus 17. This is when they've come out of Egypt and they're actually out there in the wilderness and you've got the conflict with Amalek and there's going to be a, a, a conflict or a battle. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial. Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Why? He said, For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and he called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. Mm -hmm. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. You see, he has him writing this down here for the purpose of serving as a memorial. Something that the Lord had said that the Lord was going to do. You see one of the Jehovah compound names getting linked up with it there. Jehovah Nissi, or I am your victory banner, connection with the conflict. It's something that, that Jehovah is going to have to be on behalf of Israel to deliver them from their enemies. He said, I want this to be a memorial. There, there's a Jehovah compound name. I'm going to fill in the blank for you here. One of the seven particular times that I'm going to do that, where I'm going to tell you how I'm going to put my name Jehovah into effect to be something for you that you need in relation to your enemies. He says, I want that as a memorial. You can see that concept over and over again, but here just in Exodus, before you ever get to chapter 19, you see that, conf that, uh, that concept of the memorial, the name of the Lord, the opportunity for teaching, the Jehovah compound names, the feast of the Lord, all of that that he's talking about is to be to you uh, a, a reminder in your memory from generation to generation, mm -hmm. year to year. Okay, And so all that to say that in these chapters, God has a definite purpose of educating Israel and what this name Jehovah is all about. Giving them some doctrinal comprehension and understanding of what they should understand about that and how that they should call upon it in view of uh, the, the education that they have in their own need, in view of what God's going to do. And we'll see that develop more and more. Now, Exodus chapter 3, go back here to our text chapter again. And we'll continue the reading. And let's pick up here in verse 16. Exodus 3.16, it says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together. All right, the Lord giving further instructions to Moses. He says, And say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto a land of the Canaanites, of the Hittites. And you shall say unto him, The Lord God of our, or excuse me, the Lord God of the Hebrews have met with us, 
And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, mm. no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Now this is the rest of the instructions that the Lord has given to Moses from that burning bush. He's speaking all of this to Moses at the same time here. And he's given Moses the instructions on what he's to do and also what he's to say. He's to go back to Egypt and he's to say some particular things to the elders of Israel. He's to say some particular things to the Pharaoh. And God gives him some insight in addition to what he's supposed to say and do as to the way that things are going to go when he goes back there. And there's a number of significant things that are, that are said in the text. But for the time being here, let's just point out a, a couple of things that the, the Lord is calling to Moses' attention. First of all, verse number 17, God tells Moses that he's to say some things to the elders of Israel. And the first thing that he wants him to do when he talks to these elders of Israel is he wants to have Moses call their attention to the word of God and what had been said to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. He mentions those three in particular in verse 16. And then you notice how verse 17 starts. God says, and I have said... I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and so on there. You notice how he talks about what I have said. It's past tense, isn't it? This is something that I've said in the past. I have said I will do what I just said. I'll bring you out from Egypt and I'm going to take you to the land. That's what I said. Amen. Okay, And that's what he wants Moses to go to the elders of, the, of Israel and say. That's the very first thing I want you to tell them. Point their attention to what I have said to your fathers. Okay? He wants their attention to be directed to the Word of God. Now, obviously, you've got to ask the question. If he says, I have said, where is it that God said those things? Right? Well, we first saw him start to talk about those things all the way back with Abraham. Genesis 15. Right? We looked at the prophecy there. The 400 years prophecy of four generations and so forth. He also said the, the similar thing to Jacob in Genesis 46, the night before he's ready to move down there into Egypt. God said, I'm going to visit you, I'm going to bring you out, and I'm going to take you back to the land. These are things that God had said. Okay, And he wants Israel's elders confronted with that reality. And the reason he wants them to do that is because the first thing Israel needs to be confronted with is the fact that as Jehovah, as I am that I am, what I promise, I deliver. What my word promises, my word makes good on. That's fundamental. He's going to be dealing with Israel according to his word, and he wants them to understand the, the reliability and the mutability of that word. Despite all the time that has passed, God wants him to realize what I have said is exactly what I'm now ready to do in the right time frame. Mm -hmm. You see, many of them had forgotten about it. We talked about that last week. Not many of them really had their faith anchored in that word to Abraham. God wants that brought back to their attention. First and foremost issue. They need to understand the immutability of his counsel as the eternal one. Not only that, you skip down to verse 20. And God says, And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in the midst thereof. So not only is the Lord going to perform his word, but he tells them that he's going to be judging Egypt. I'm going to smite them. I'm going to show my wonders. While you're there, captives... You're going to see God's power go into effect to judge that nation that you've been serving. Okay, Now, I point that out because God had spoken about that level of detail back there with Abraham. 
Genesis 15. Familiar with this passage, so I'll just hit this quickly. But in Genesis 15, 14, right, right in the midst of the Lord speaking to Abraham back there when he's given the prophecy on the front end of it, he talked about how they would go into this, uh, this nation, they would be afflicted and they would serve this nation the number of the years and so forth. In Genesis 15, 14, he says, and also, all right, here's some additional information he's giving, and also that nation whom they shall serve, the Egypt, will I judge. See, I'm going to judge that nation. And so you've got God talking about it to Abraham, and all these many years later, when the time has been fulfilled, you've got God saying the exact same thing. I'm showing up on time, and I'm going to judge the nation that's been afflicting you and that you've been serving. The Lord, as the Lord prepares to deliver Israel, he's speaking about smiting Egypt in judgment first. That nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And so what you can see in that comparison is that not only that what God says is true, but the order of events in which he says he's going to do it is true. What he says is very precise and it's very reliable. You can look at what he says and inspect that for what it says and expect that exactly what it says is the way that it's actually going to be. I know what I've said and I know the order in which I've said it, and that's the way it's going to go, Moses. And I want you to tell the elders of Israel that. The order of things is lining up. And the Lord makes it clear here, it is an important point in view of what's going to be coming. The Lord makes it clear that Israel's not going to be brought out until after that smiting takes place. Okay? Uh, in Exodus 3.20 there, he, say, he, is, he says, he continues on, showing his wonders, and I'll do in the midst thereof. He says, and after that, they will let you go. <clears throat> after that. You're not going to be brought out until after the smiting of Egypt takes place. You see that same terminology in Genesis 15, 14. And also that nation will I uh, shout that they shall serve, will I judge, and afterward they shall come out. See? Very precise detail. I'm pointing it out because with a long span of time, God has not forgotten what he said. Mm. He's not foggy on it. He doesn't just have the, the general paraphrased concept of what he said. He's meticulous about every single word that he said. And after all this time, he's still here saying the exact same thing. Yes. Okay? That's important. That's, that's how Israel is supposed to be confronted with the knowledge of this God. What he says, he does not forget, and he always fulfill, uh, fulfills exactly as he said it. It's, it's like I said a couple of weeks ago, that the, passages of, uh, the passage of time does not cause God to become forgetful or for his zeal to wane in relation to what he said. He's just as zealous to fulfill his promises today as the day that it came out of his mouth. Amen. And he's confronting them with that reality. But that's not even all. Okay, look at the prophecy here. Genesis 15, 14, he continues. He says, and after that, shall they come out with great substance. Now that, that's a fascinating phrase there when you really think about what he's saying. He's going to deliver them, yes. He's going to smite the nation that's been afflicting them, yes. But he says that not only am I going to get you out and you're going to be delivered, but when you come out, you're going to come out with great substance. Those that were ruling over you and afflicting you, those that you were slaves to and that were your master, not only am I going to take you out from their grip, but they're, you're actually going to be made rich at the expense of your oppressors. Now, you, you look at that from a logical standpoint. How improbable does that seem? I mean, it seems improbable that he's even going to bring them out, to tell you the truth. When you look at how powerful Egypt is and all the things that are working against them, just the fact that they would ever even be able to get out of there. But to, to put the icing on the cake, so to speak, God says, you know, I'm not just getting you out. I'm getting you out and you're going to be enriched by your enemies when you come out. That's fascinating to me. I mean, that, you think about that and that's really over the top, to tell you the truth. 
I mean, that, that's a radical, radical concept. Yes, sir. And you don't almost have to be a fool to think that's actually what was going to happen. Right? Because it's just so crazy. You have to be a fanatic to believe that. Because it's so over the top. I'm being a little facetious here, but I imagine the conversation of the day probably was, you know, that's so over the top, we might need to spiritualize that a little bit. <laughs> right? I mean, God's going to get us out with great substance, and we're going to be enriched by the Egyptians. That, surely that's not literally what he means. He just meant in a spiritual kind of way. You see? Well, what's God think about that? What's he say to Moses about that? Exodus 3. Verse 21. Exodus 3, he says, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor, and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them on your sons and your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Does that sound to you like God expected Israel to spiritualize what he said? Mm-mm. That sounds like he is intent on literally doing what he said. All right? He's not, he's not teaching them to, to read this in a spiritual way. You go right back to the promise of what he said, he'll come out with great substance. He's describing what great substance is. Silver and gold, literally. Raiment and clothes and things that your sons and daughters are going to wear. You're going to spoil the Egyptians. Their riches, they're not going to have anymore because they're going to be with you. That sound like God expects Moses or Israel to look at his word and his promises and to, to spiritualize them because they're so far-fetched, as it were, the human reason. You see the concept demonstrated that exactly what God says is exactly what God means, literally. Amen. That's the way that he wants his nation to know him and to interpret what he says. He's given them all these concepts from the very beginning, not only that he's a God that does what he says, that is relied upon, that he knows every intricate detail of it, and every word of it is important, but it's as simple as the fact that God says what he means, and he means what he says to whom he speaks. Yes, sir. You don't have to contrive all this spiritual nonsense and to tie yourself into a bunch of knots. You just have to believe what he says, yeah. right? And, and believe me, as Jehovah... Jehovah is going to do some things that are pretty far-fetched as far as human logic would say. Amen. Okay? He has no problem doing that. And he's, he's going to be teaching them about this just to simply trust what his word says as he educates them in that. Now, as you read on into chapter 4, the first 18 verses of chapter 4, you're going to see some things develop there. Signs are given to Moses to perform when he goes back to Egypt. You've got the sign that God gives him where he casts down the rod and it becomes a serpent. Takes it up again by the tail and it becomes a rod. Gives him the second sign of the, the leprous hand. Puts it into his bosom and pulls it out. It's leprous. And then again and it's healed. Giving him the signs to show. And, and that is very significant. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more as we go along. You've got Aaron joining Moses. Right? Moses protests that he's not eloquent, he can't speak, and God ends up sending Aaron, his brother, along with him. He says, I know he can speak well, and you've got Aaron joining up with Moses there, and they're going to be headed back to Egypt to do what God says. And God overcomes all the objections, and then as you skip down to verse number 19, of chapter 4, God goes on here to say, The Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life, and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, and he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. That's right. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Mm. Now there's really a lot to digest in those few verses. 
There's, there's multiple things working and being set up for what's coming in the, the next chapters. And we'll have to look at another aspect of this probably next week. But for right now, I just want you to notice how God speaks about this, this nation of Israel that he's going to be bringing out of Egypt. Mm-hmm. Okay. When he goes back there, this is, this is the things that he wants, God wants Moses to be saying to the Pharaoh there. And there's significance for why he's saying it to Pharaoh and so forth. But he says, thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, verse 22, thus saith the Lord. This is Jehovah speaking. And Jehovah says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Israel is my son. He's talking about a nation here in terminology of being his son. Now, to appreciate the significance of that somewhat, to understand some things about what, what God has in mind and what he's conveying in that, you have to kind of understand a little bit about the, the concept of biblical sonship adoption and the way that God intends for his program and his business to be run with his people. Um, when we talk about the issue of a son of God in the scriptures and the concept of the adoption of sons, that really conveys a, a purpose of God to have a special relationship with individuals and, and with the collective group there, an elect group between himself and them. God is declaring a relationship that he intends to have with the nation that is a sonship relationship. And there's some distinct features to that. Sonship provides for a personal education from a father to a son. Almost like a, an apprenticeship. The father has a business He's got wisdom and knowledge of the way that he wants his business to run. And at a certain point, he brings his son under his tutelage or his apprenticeship. And he begins to personally educate his son and to train him in the wisdom that he possesses in that business so that that son can labor together with him in that business. Mm -hmm. That's the adoption concept. There's a personal education in that where the father instills his wisdom in his son. It also involves... As I alluded to, the objective of replicating the father's wisdom in the son so that the son is equipped to labor with his father in that business and ultimately receive from that business the inheritance of the riches that that business produces. That's a very general concept of what the adoption of sons is talking about in the scriptures. Okay? Now, the adoption of sons is taught pointedly other places in the scripture where you see these types of concepts. If you run over to Galatians chapter 4, real quick, Paul talks about this to the body of Christ. This concept of the adoption of sons, Galatians 4, verse, beginning verse 1. He says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, Though he be Lord of all, verse 2, but is under the tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul, obviously talking to the Galatians here, he's, he's contrasting for them the, difference that, uh, the differences that exist between being dealt with by God as a child under the instruction of tutors and governors versus being in the relationship of an adult son who is dealt with by God according to a spirit of adoption. Okay? And the fundamental aspects of the, the difference is that as a son, an adult, not a child, but as a son, you've got freedom from a bondage and fear motivation. The son is freed from the dominion of the tutors and the governors. They're dismissed, and he receives that personal education direct from his father. And a son, likewise, being placed as an adult, becomes an heir, and he has certain decision-making capacity out of personal liberty. He's able to operate upon the wisdom that his father's taught him. Okay? 
That wisdom has been instilled in the Son, and based upon that wisdom, he therefore can go out and operate to carry out the will of the Father in the business. Okay? And that's, that's a big difference. The child, though he's Lord of all, though he's the heir, he differs nothing from a servant. That's not the relationship that he's in. He doesn't have that personal instruction. But when it comes to the time appointed of the Father and he's placed as a son, in that relationship, he's personally taught and schooled by his Father so that he can labor together with his Father and be a partaker of the inheritance. He talks about him being an heir. You've got all those concepts wrapped up here in the adoption of sons. And, of course, there's a lot more uh, to that. And uh, you can see that he's making a connection between a son and an heir of God here. Somebody who labors together with God and what he's doing uh, by his uh, spirit-led instruction. If he's a son, then he's an heir of God through Christ. Now, in Galatians, Paul, of course, is speaking that by Christ. Okay, But we need to understand that the adoption of sons as a concept is something that God intends to utilize greatly. But the overall framework of what the adoption of sons conveys is applicable to both his program with Israel and his program for the church, which is the body of Christ. Okay, You can see that. Uh, Romans 9, we talked about this when we were coming through Romans. Uh, Romans 9, 4, speaking of his kinsmen according to the flesh, Paul said, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption? Right. All right, so there's an adoption of sons that belongs to Israel as well. That whole concept of the way God intended to deal with his people in connection with his purpose on the earth. And I believe that's that's really at the heart of the concept of what God's declaring back in Exodus uh, chapter 4 here. As he's having Moses declare this to Pharaoh, and of course understanding the spiritual element of it, that there's an adversary behind that Pharaoh, really that's got his great darkness grip upon God's nation. God is having Moses come and declare the reality of the fact that Israel is my son, even my firstborn. This is my nation that you have under your grip. And this nation is specifically called in connection with laboring together with me in my purpose or my business on this earth. See? And because Israel is my son, mm. even my firstborn, the firstborn being connected with an issue of heirship, He's declaring the fact that this nation that you've got in your possession, under your control, is my son. Therefore, as my son, you need to let my son go, verse 23, that he may serve me. I've got a purpose. I've got a business on this earth that this nation is called in connection with. And therefore, you need to let him go so that my business can go forward. Okay? That's the concept. He's declaring the reality of what he's intending to do with this nation. And he's doing that, as it says there, thus saith the Lord. He's connecting the name Jehovah with the purpose of this nation. This people that you've got in your grasp are the people of the Lord. They're my people. They're called in connection with my purpose. They're supposed to be in my land fulfilling my will. All right. But if you notice, they're not doing that. They're under your thumb, under your affliction, in your service, doing your will. So therefore, let my people go that they may serve me. To me, in connection with my purpose on the earth. Therefore, let my son go. There's a lot more that you could look at in connection with that. My, my point simply is that the Lord is, in bringing Israel out, he's declaring his purpose and how to use them. His, his intent is for them to come out and to function and be a godly people. A people that think like he thinks, does things in his way, and labors together with him in what he's doing. Israel's called to be a godly nation doing godly things. And God wants that relationship to be there between him and this nation, that father-to-son relationship. Okay, And really that, that's all rooted and it goes all the way back to God's original purpose with Adam. That's what God intended when he came to Adam in the cool of the day. At the voice of the Lord God walked with him. He began to educate Adam in the garden, made him as a help meet for God in accordance with his purpose on the earth. Man falls. You see the successive chapters until you come to Abraham. God invests that original purpose for the earth in Abraham. And how they developed and they've grown. God again is declaring that same basic purpose that's now vested in Israel. I'm going to utilize them in that way. And the relationship that I'm going to have is I'm going to be near unto them. I want to be a personal God to them. I am going to be everything that they need to be in the midst. And they're going to labor together with me to have that light go to the ends of the earth. 
and reach the darkness of those nations, Amen. you see. That's the purpose. That's the relationship whereby God intends for that to be done. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. That's, that's the desire that he has. And he's declaring that. Now what that is, in addition to a declaration of his purpose, is that's really meant to be a provocation of the adversary. Mm -hmm. You see that, we'll see some things about that earlier here and things that God says and tells Moses specifically to do. He wants some things done specifically that's meant to provoke a certain reaction from the adversary that's holding them. Right? Because he said, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to show all my wonders. We'll see verse where he says that he's going to get for himself a name. His name's going to be spread abroad through the earth and things that are going on here. So really, in saying what he says here, and the way he declares that he's provoking a certain response. He, he wants a hardening to take place so that the Pharaoh and the adversary behind him responds to this nation in a particular way. And that's what we're going to see. That's what's going to start taking place. And that's the other side of it. Not only the declaration of God's purpose, but a provocation of the power of the adversary because there's going to be a, a pitting of power against power that goes on here over the next few chapters in Egypt. And God means to do some special things uh, in connection with that, so that when Israel's brought out, there's a fear and dread of them, and a fear and dread of the name of the Lord that gets carried out through all the earth. And all that gets tied into his purpose with them in the land, what he means to establish. And we'll look at some more things on that, uh, but that's all really set up for what's coming in these chapters to come. And there's a whole lot that's about to take place in Egypt. And we'll start getting some uh, insight into that yes, next week. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Amen. Our God and our Father, we're grateful for the time. We pray that you take these concepts that have been shared tonight and allow that to serve as a foundation for the weeks to come and the things that we'll see. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, just to uh, come to a greater comprehension of your name and all that that means for Israel and in turn also what that, that name means for us as well. We give you thanks and the praise in Christ's name. Amen.